Okay, go ahead. Great. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Texas Rare Disease Day virtual edition, as we are all accustomed to these last 12 months. Um, my name is Kirsten Angel. I'm the Associate Director of Advocacy here at NORD. And I'm going to kick us off today with uh, two brief videos and, and then we'll get the show going. I am Tristan. Angelina. And I'm Isaiah Shafiq. Regina. Habari asubui, Javi. I live in the United States of America. In Australia. Malaysia. No Brazil. Tonight, Kenya. My passion is for fashion and design. I love to dance. 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 When your disease makes you feel isolated. It's difficult to walk. When I'm tired. Afraid. O controle da doença pode ser desafiador. But we learned to be resilient. Para apreciar os pequenos detalhes que me trazem alegria. Kumona mtoto wangu wa kiume anavifurahi tunapoenda nje. Nikijua anasikiza hadithi na sauti zilizo karibu. Mchana hii tete kumbona ndio mashaka ya mtakuna sai sita uje. that folks one second welcome i'm peter saltenstall president and ceo of the national organization for rare disorders and would like to welcome you to our 2021 virtual rare disease day event before we begin, I'd like to send out a special thank you to all those advocates and others who have spent so much energy and time supporting the rare disease community. So thank you. The role of Rare Disease Day is to bring together advocates and patients from around the world to help tell the story about rare diseases. There are events like this happening virtually all over this country today. And some of the audiences that we're really trying to focus on are those in the state legislatures where advocates and legislative people come together to understand the burden of rare diseases and the impacts it can have on them and therefore build the appropriate legislation and pathway to make sure that bills are passed that support rare disease patients. As a matter of fact, NORD's doing that in a very focused way with rare disease advisory councils. We've got them set up down 16 states and are building them in others. I think 2021 is going to be an interesting year for us. The reason I say that is because we've just come off of a very difficult year with a pandemic that's impacted the rare disease community in a number of different ways and has really shown some of the inequities in the healthcare system. For all of you that are watching today, the importance of the rare disease advisory councils is critical to the success of being able to communicate the story and the needs of the rare disease patient community. So in conclusion, I would really like to make sure that I recognize and thank all of those sponsors who have helped us make this day a reality. 
without your continued support, none of this would happen. So a sincere thank you from all of us at Nord and the patient community. Taking part in events like today's are really important to the rare disease community. And we must always remember that alone we are rare and together we are strong. Okay, I'm going to switch my screen here. <clears throat> So welcome everybody. Um, we have just a quick medical and legal disclaimer. Uh, Nord and our volunteers are unable to provide medical and legal advice. Um, you can read this full disclaimer uh, in the chat box. Um, and also please utilize the chat to ask questions throughout the program. Um, and we'll be also posting any links you see uh, throughout the program will be posted within the chat as well. Um, I now uh, have the distinct pleasure to introduce our wonderful volunteer state ambassador for Texas, Debbie Skolaski. Debbie? Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us today for the 2021 Rare Disease Day virtual event. As Kristen said, I'm Deborah Skolaski, the NORD Rare Action Network Volunteer Ambassador for Texas. And we are so happy to be co-hosting this year's event with Baylor College of Medicine and Texas Children's Hospital. We are also thankful that you were able to join us today as we are all still thawing out from last week's Arctic freeze. And with that, I wanted to let you know that NORD has funds available for rare disease patients and families affected by natural disasters. And at the end of today's program, I'll share a link where you can apply. I'd like to briefly share my connection to RARE and why I advocate for the rare disease community here in Texas. My granddaughter, Corey, has a rare genetic terminal disorder called metachromatic leukodystrophy, or MLD for short. MLD causes demyelination of the central nervous system. Seven years ago, when Corey was first diagnosed, there was no treatment and no cure. But now there's a newborn screening test and several gene therapy treatments that are all waiting for FDA approval. When Corey was first diagnosed, I saw the various hurdles and obstacles that her parents faced, like finding a specialist, navigating the medical insurance maze, Medicaid qualification, getting physical therapy, and the list goes on. These are all common issues faced by all the rare disease patients. And so I decided I wanted to make a difference and give the rare disease a community a voice, which is what I've been trying to do ever since. And now I'd like to pass it over to my co-host, Salma Nalsef from Baylor College of Medicine and Texas Children's Hospital. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, on behalf of Baylor College of Medicine and Texas Children's, I also wanna welcome you to the 2021 Rare Disease Day presentation. Like Debbie said, my name is Salma Nassif, and I'm a clinical genetic counselor and program leader here at Baylor College of Medicine. In the clinical setting, I specialize in prenatal and preconception counseling, and I work with families each day that are connected with rare disease. In the program setting, I train future genetic counselors that will be entering the world of genetics and rare disease and will one day be working with many of you and your families. For the past four years, I've had the privilege of planning and executing our Rare Disease Day events in the city of Houston alongside Texas Children's Hospital. And, and fingers crossed, hopefully in 2022, we will have our uh, live in-person event again. But this year, we are very privileged and happy to co-host the event with Nord, and we hope you enjoy the program today. So with that, I'll turn it over to Anissa Reed the state policy manager for the Eastern region to review our state report. Great, thank you everyone for joining. Um, so let's start with the problem. More than 25 million Americans are living with one of the more than 7,000 unique rare diseases. That breaks down to about one in 10 Americans. So even though that may seem like a lot, state decision makers still have limited awareness of the issues and impact that rare diseases have on patients, 
their caregivers, and the overall healthcare system. Next slide, please. Thank you. So what's the solution? Nord believes it's to create RDAX, a diverse body to advise state government on the common obstacles that the rare disease community faces. We see this as an enormous opportunity for government officials and the rare disease community to work together to develop resources necessary to prevent and address barriers in a strategic way. There are a number of differences between each RDAC um, in different states, including the number of members on the council, varied members of the rare disease community represented on the council, differences in where the council works out of, funding, and duties and accountability mechanisms. So overall, each RDAC has the same goal of supporting the rare disease community by increasing the voice of rare disease patients and caregivers at the state level. So to date, 16 states have passed RDAC legislation. We're also excited to share that there are RDAC bills that are being heard in several other states at this time. Um, so as mentioned, we are thrilled to have RDAC legislation that was passed in 16 states, but we really want to continue increasing this number to give as many rare disease advocates a voice in state government as possible. The board highly encourages that different state RDACs collaborate with one another to share ideas and best practices. We plan to continue to develop and release toolkits and one-pagers, host webinars, and convene additional meetings to support ongoing RDAC. Great. So what is the status uh, in, of RDACs in Texas? So at this time, Texas does not have an RDAC in place. However, uh, we have several great advocates in the state who are passionate about the rare disease community. Um, so Texas ha is in the process of building a diverse coalition to discuss what the rare disease community in Texas would like to see in an RDAC and work together to push legislation across the finish line. So if you're interested in getting involved in these efforts, then please send an email to rdac at raredisease.org. Thank you. Uh, so now I'm going to jump into an overview of an important tool that we use at NORD. In 2015, NORD launched its state report card project with the goal of evaluating how effectively states are serving people with rare diseases. This year marks the sixth edition of the state report card which was compiled using data current as of November 2020. So these are the policy issues that NORD's report card focuses on. It's important to note, however, that these issues are not exhaustive. These issues touch on several critical and relevant policy areas at the state level, but with each state issue included, there are still many others that are capable of impacting the lives of rare disease patients. Great. So how do you find out where your state measures at? So you can select um, your state by clicking that link. Each state page is also available in a printable version. Uh, next slide, please. Great, so how do you find out, um, you know, what issues are most important? So we know that there are several issues that impact the rare disease community. Again, this is just a snapshot of some policy issues we've seen impact them um, in 2020. So, Current legislation um, and 2021 changes so far have not yet been captured in the sixth edition, but we will see that um, in the seventh edition that'll be released next year. Appendices included are in detailed data. There's also sections where you can learn more about each policy issue that we focus on. Slide please. Great, so if you have any questions about our report card, then you can always send us an email at policy at rarediseases.org. And now I will pass it back over to Debbie, thank you. Thank you. We'd like to share some patient stories with you. And so please join me in welcoming Meredith Mahoney and her story. Meredith? Uh, hello, my name is Meredith, and I would first like to start by thanking Nord and Texas Children's for allowing me to speak today and share my family's journey to diagnosis. Now, I could talk about this for hours, and I'm trying to fit it all in, uh, into about three minutes, so I'm sure I'm going to miss something, but please bear with me. Olivia's journey started when she was about a year old. Up to this point, she was a totally healthy, normal baby, no prenatal issues, and a normal birth. She had been hitting all of her developmental milestones until about a year uh, about a year old, and then she just fell off the chart. She was an 18-month-old toddler stuck in the body of a nine-month-old baby. 
We started seeing a neurologist who ordered a battery of testing. The MRI alone was over $1,000, which at the time we didn't have the money for. Thankfully, our parents and credit cards were there and able to help us out. We applied for Medicaid, which we were denied because we made just a little bit too much money. We still do not uh, qualify at this point in time and are on a 10 year plus wait list for a waiver. So up to this point, Olivia had had multiple MRIs, EMGs, EEGs, LPs, and every blood test you could think of, and everything came back normal. Nothing could account for her, for her speech, gross, and fine motor delay, or explain why her muscles were so tight, and the fact that she could, could only take one or two steps on her very tiptoes. We'd been seeing a slew of doctors, had been discharged from a few services because Olivia was just too complicated and there was nothing else they could do for us. I felt like I was beating my head against a wall, trying to get someone to listen to me and help me. We eventually ended up at Texas Children's Hospital in their genetics department. They ordered a uh, whole XM sequencing and complete microarray testing to see if they could identify any faulty genes. Me, my husband, Olivia, all went and had blood drawn and thankfully the team there was able to help us with funding. Uh, in 2015, the genetic testing wasn't covered by insurance as it was classified as experimental. And each one individually costs thousands of dollars. The team sent off the blood work and we waited and we waited and we waited some more. About nine months later, we got a call back only to hear that everything was normal and we had hit yet another dead end. And there was nothing else they could really do for us. I refused to take that answer and began a search for doctors that would be willing to listen to me and help me fight for my daughter. That search landed me in the office of Dr. Parnez, who specialized in movement disorders and referred us to his colleague, Dr. Lisa Emmerich, who is one of our medical angels. She, she suggested that we apply to be in a research study with the Undiagnosed Disease Network. They helped families like mine that had been up and down every avenue of medical testing and still had no answers. We worked with them and sent more blood and skin biopsies. And after about a year in 2015, we were told that they too couldn't find anything that matched Olivia in their database, yet another dead end. They informed us that we may never find out the cause of Olivia's symptoms and that the best way to move forward was to treat her symptomatically. <clears throat> they told us they would call us if anything came up and that they were always updating their database. A few years went on and we were living our lives. We had our second child, Jack, and we never exper uh, expected to hear anything else about it. Then in September of 2019, close to Olivia's seventh birthday, I got a call from our wonderful genetics counselor, letting us know that they had found something. These were the words I had been waiting five years to hear. I had put so much effort and hope into this journey and had accepted that we were never going to get the answers we were looking for, but they had them and I was so excited and could do nothing but cry tears of joy and hope. We met with the genetics team at the lab and they shared the paper that they were going to publish about Olivia and her gene mutation. We found out that Olivia has an EIF2AK1 gene mutation, and she is the only person worldwide known to have this gene mutation at this time. We were so excited to have answers, but also crushed to know that we were still the only ones. No one knows how this disease is going to, is going to progress and what Olivia's long-term out goals are going to be like. We fast forward to current day. I am here sharing my story with all of you to advocate not only for my daughter, but for all of us that are battling to find answers and battling these rare diseases. It is hard and almost impossible to get support and funding for treatment. The world wants everything and everyone to fit in these nice, perfect little boxes and this community is anything but. We are different, rare, and amazing, but we need help. Help to get the care that we need, help to get funding for medical equipment and medications, and there is a real lack of resources for us. But I genuinely believe that we may each be fighting our own rare disease ba uh, battle, but together we are strong. We may be few in numbers, but we are rare, and together we can change the world. I will leave you with this one last thought. Olivia, who is only eight years old, has accepted that she has a gene mutation and that she is different. But as she says, mom, you know who else has gene mutations? Superheroes. And she is my superhero. No, wait, before you move. Thank you, Meredith. Now, now I got to introduce, huh, after that, um, 
I'd like to introduce Molly Plant. Molly is the NORD Rare Action Network Community Liaison, and she is the founder of the COPA Syndrome Foundation. Molly. Hello all, okay, there we go. Thank you very much, Debbie. I would like to thank NORD and Baylor College of, oops, sorry. You are have to forgive me, I lost my whole entire screen. I would like to thank NORD and Baylor College of Medicine and Texas Children's Hospital for hosting Rare Disease Day and providing an opportunity for me to tell a story, our story, meaning my family, my sons, and our journey to a diagnosis of his rare disease. I know I only have three minutes to talk, and I will try to bit my best to fit 28 years into this time limit. Christopher was born a preemie, but there was a, he was only on a ventilator for one hour. He came home with us a month after his birth. By the second month, his precious life had, he began to have issues. He was hospitalized for RSV, and then the doctors thought at that time from the RSV, he began to have reflux, and x-rays and CT scans had, show, had shown that he was having reflux. Christopher continued to get sick, and by six months, Christopher had had his first lung biopsy. This biopsy at the time showed that they, what they thought was reflux. What was crucial to me during this time, after, while he was, had his lung biopsy, was meeting with all the doctors. They said this was an easy fix and they would just do a fund application and this would correct, correct the reflux. So simple and everything would just go back to normal. But there was one doctor who stayed behind and he said, mom, I do not think that this is reflux. And if in three months, nothing changes, I want you to push the doctors to further look into this. So thus begins my push to advocate for my son. Those words from a doctor was life-changing for me. I did not understand what true meaning they would have. Chris continued to be sick on and off again. We were on steroids, we were hospitalized for different infections. He didn't seem to be gaining any ground. And again, at two years of age, Christopher went in for a second lung biopsy, which showed the same results. But now he had a diffuse lung disease. The fundification did not work. <clears throat> from, from two to four, Christopher continued to be in and out of hospitals for pneumonia, not eating, fevers, coughing, needing oxygen different medications, and all at this time, as a mother, I think, what have I done? Did I do this to my child? Is he suffering because I ate too much tuna when I was pregnant? How did I harm him? Did I harm my baby? I can't help him. And I'm constantly asking doctors questions and saying, with a list, I ate this, I took him to see Santa when he was two months of age, he got sick. And this was a constant track that was playing in my mind. We had been living in New Mexico and we were moving back to Texas. And this was wonderful because here began our journey at Texas Children's Hospital that we lived with and spent seeing Dr. Leland Fan. Now to wrap the four, starting at four years of age in four to 11, together, there was not changes. We had the same patterns of treatments, the same hospitalizations, different medications, and yet nothing we seemed to be doing slowed down the progression of Christopher's lung disease. By 11 years of age, Christopher began full time of oxygen and this was his lifeline. In 2003, again, the doctors sent off his blood to be genetically tested. And they were hoping from the time when he was two to now when he was 11, that genetic testing would have some answers and we would, we would know. So 11 years more go by, and in 2014, Christopher got a Facebook message from a person whose last name matches his, and they asked, are you Christopher with a lung disease? Facebook. 
message, very strange. And he said, hey, mom, someone wants to know that who am I? And, and am I the person that has lung disease? And I said, well, answer them. This was a defining moment in our lives. Chris had said, mom, there's a doctor in California that wants to talk to me, but I think you should talk to him to see what he wants. I agreed. And in October of 2014, I talked to Dr. Anthony Shum from UCSF. And we were going through a series of questions and history. He tells me he had been studying Christopher's relatives and he was looking at genome and he was doing some genome sequencing. Well, I had said that Chris had been through this twice already and nothing was discovered. But I sign off once again, send all the records and history to Dr. Shum. And at the end of two, November 2014, Dr. Shim calls me and he is very excited. He seems that Christopher was the missing link. All the early diagnostics, the testing, the ins and outs of the hospital, all the recording, and here was this genetic test. And they had found what they were looking for. And more importantly, they were going to be writing a paper and publishing this. I will know what my son has. So on April 20th, 2015, and I'm quoting from Peter Farley at UCSF, using the latest genome sequencing techniques, a research, a research team led by scientists from UC San Francisco, the Baylor College of Medicine, and Texas Children's Hospital had identified a new autoimmune syndrome characterized by com a combination of severe lung disease and arthritis that has currently no therapy. It's named COPA syndrome. COPA, which is actually the codimer protein com complex subunit alpha, a whole lot of words that I just like to call COPA syndrome. So it took 23 years to get an answer for this rare disease. Genetic testing had solved the mystery that it plagued not only my son, but at the time, five other families and 21 others who were suffering with COPA syndrome. April 20. April 20th, 2015 is my forever date, but our life-changing date is August 26, 2018. And this is the biggest day. We call that breath day. My son had had a double lung transplant that has now changed our journey and our medical search in other ways. That was a long history, but with all that being said, this is what Rare Disease Day celebrates. It's a coming together. It's a time for learning. It's a time where we get to share our journey for all of us that has been touched by a rare disease. This is a day where we get together as a patient, caregiver, doctors, medical staff, and countless others to learn, to see what advocacy looks like. And in closing, I would like to share a poem that my son had written. It's titled, Who Am I? To you, I'm probably nobody. To people who stare at me in public, I am different. To my family, I am strength and inspiration. To my friends, I'm a reminder not to take things for granted. Sometimes I stare in the mirror and wonder, who am I? Can one person be all these things? The answer seems foggy like a mirror after a hot shower. Society says I'm disabled. Doctors say I'm sick. Get told these things enough and you begin to believe what they say. You begin to feel like something you're just bought at the store with a predetermined expiration date. But I know that is not who I am. So who am I? I'm an artist, I'm a writer, I'm a poet, I'm a computer expert, I'm a comedian, I'm a good person, I'm a bad person, I'm mean, I'm nice, I'm flawed. I'm whoever I decide to be. No one defines who you are except for you. I am human and I am my own image of normal. Thank you for having me today and letting me share with all of you. Thank you so much, Molly. I love that poem of his, as you well know. And now I have the distinct pleasure of inter uh, introducing our featured speaker, Dr. Tuan Chow. Dr. Chow is a member of the faculty at the Jan and Dan, uh, Dan Duncan Neurological Research Institute at Texas Children's Hospital and Baylor College of Medicine. 
She received her MD and PhD degrees from Baylor College of Medicine as a medical scientist training program McNair scholar. In 2018, Dr. Chow was appointed as a joint primary faculty member in the departments of molecular and human genetics and pediatrics. Her long-term goal is to identify the critical cell populations and cellular pathways to target for therapeutic interventions in childhood neurological disorders. Dr. Chow's research has earned recognition from the National Health Institute's DP5 Early Independence Award, the Burroughs Welcome Fund Career Award for Medical Specialists, American Academy of Neurology and the American Brain Foundation, Pediatric Epilepsy Research Foundation, Child Neurology Society and the Child Neurology Foundation, and by the Robert and Janice McNair Foundation. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Chow. Hi, thank you, Debbie, for the kind introduction. I'm so glad to be here today with everyone. I actually see many friends <laughs> um, and good friends too in the, in the audience. So I'm excited to share today with you. And um, I just switched over to my part presentation. Um, so it's wonderful that we're still able to gather today and kind of share our stories and um, what we've accomplished so far and what we're looking forward and eager to be able to accomplish in the future to come. And in particular, I wanna highlight with you uh, everything that we've heard so far really bridges upon you know, um, serendipitous discoveries, but also more importantly, there's a lot of teamwork and a lot of co collaboration that go into this undiagnosed odyssey and then how we're able to come up with some very much needed answers. And that's really what I wanna be able to highlight over the next few minutes with all of you is our work in this journey. So, you know, from the onset of the genomic revolution just a couple decades ago, it seems so recent and still so, so far at the same time, um, there was a lot of technological changes, a lot of scientific discoveries that really allowed us to better understand what, what is a gene? What are these genes that are so important for different parts of our brain, to, uh, body and brain to be built and to function appropriately? And by understanding our genes better, we also were starting to get a better handle for how these genes, when they were just slightly changed, altered, sometimes in subtle ways, um, could actually have really long ranging implications to how um, our health is. And in terms of the brain, it would impact many different levels of how we're able to think and process and interact um, with the world around us. And so the challenge that we've all been facing now is finding these genetic causes is the end of one chapter in the Odyssey, but it does mean it's the onset of a next one where we need to be able to understand what do these mean and what can we do about it? And really it's, it's a continued journey from that point. You know, we um, start with these genetic studies, which really depend upon a lot of support, support from the research community, from the clinical community, from the families to understand the importance of what you've heard about with the whole exome sequencing, with the um, whole chromosomal microarray studies. These things give us an idea of where changes are beginning to happen. But we need to then understand, well, how do we know if that change, if, if it's the only one so far um, that we've seen, how do we know if it's creating any issues for how that gene is supposed to function normally? And for that, we often, we need to partner up and we need to work very closely with our research colleagues and um, my team as well. We develop many of these assays, usually in fruit flies or even the little mouse um, and cells that we sometimes get from these skin biopsies. They begin to tell us the picture of what these genetic changes are, are doing and the implications of that to our health. And of course, our ultimate goal is that hopefully maybe this can lead us to some sort of a therapeutic avenue. Now, a lot of the stories that you've heard about um, so far in their own work in, in addition, works very closely with a very large nationwide network um, of researchers uh, called the Undiagnosed Diseases Network. This started from the original NIH Undiagnosed Diseases Project, and then they recognized the immediate value and the benefit of having a dedicated team of, well, a very large team of multiple different experts in both clinical medicine and biomedical research and working with model organisms to solve um, rare diseases and give us an answer for what the genetic causes might be. And so by expanding it across the country now, um, and we collaborate not just within our nation, but also internationally, we're truly able to now begin to solve many of these medical challenges and mysteries 
through team science that's very wide ranging. And so I'm gonna use this as an example and share with you one very important story that I think highlights um, what we are able to do now for both rare disease and also implications for also more common diseases um, by simply working together as a team. So the story, like many of the others you've heard, does begin with a mystery. And for us, it began with the mystery of the first little girl, Colette, who I met when I was a resident at Texas Children's Hospital, and trying to find out well, what was the answer behind her unique challenges that she was facing growing up. And then realizing that there was another little boy in Hawaii, Chase and his family, who was also similarly on this journey. And Chase and his family um, were, got involved with the Undiagnosed Diseases Network and ultimately has now opened up um, a, a very large community and many exciting avenue now for us to understand their mystery and their answer. And for them, as well as many others here. So what we realized was that pretty early on that they had um, a misspelling, a slight change in a gene called early B cell factor three or EBF3. And the name itself means it does some things for our immune system cells, but it also more importantly, it's a very important gene for how our brain develops and functions. And so given the fact that they had, you know, slower to walk, slower to talk, some ideas that maybe a gene that's important for brain development might be providing an answer there, um, suggested that these genetic changes might be critical. And what's also interesting about this gene is that it's what we consider a master controller. It's one of the early genes that determine how many, many other genes are supposed to turn on or turn off at the right place in the right time. So basically it's like the architect of the city of your map of the brain and lays out everything in the proper timing. And so if it's not quite behaving the way it should, then it might throw off that map just a little bit. And this is so important that this gene itself looks almost identical from if you're a little fruit fly to a mouse or to a human, which tells us it's really essential for brain development and function. And it also tells us we're now able to do a lot of studies of these genetic changes that we're finding in these families and children in the fruit fly and the mice. So what we did in the UDN at the time and um, with my team and our collaborators at the Jan and Dan Duncan Neurological Research Institute with Texas Children's and Baylor College of Medicine is we developed an approach where we can take these genetic changes in people and actually put it in the fruit fly, the exact same gene, exact same change in a little fly. And the fly actually told us that those changes were indeed really important and that it was making the gene not able to function like it should. And this told us essentially, it was like we made the gene work at half capacity essentially. So it wasn't able to go full steam to do its job. So that's why it was a little bit behind. The patterning is a little bit different um, when we had these genetic changes. And so immediately it began to give us an indication that this gene is probably really important for not just our normal typical development state, but that if you shift it just a little bit, it's going to shift a little bit how your brain is developing and how it's working. And our work, as well as those of two other large teams that was internationally based, came together at the end of 2016 to report on the discovery that EBF3 genetic changes caused a condition called hypotonia for low muscle tone, ataxia for motor incoordination and imbalance, and delayed development syndrome. So it's a mouthful, and we call it EBF3-related HADS now, um, to recognize the gene and then also the spectrum of findings that we see most commonly in people. And this discovery, this one single gene discovery and the recognition that there were many others who shared the same story, the same journey, and it was all due to these genetic alterations in this gene, um, actually rapidly started to grow a community. So for families who felt very much alone or in a community where they really didn't see others sharing the similar story, now they realize that they could connect and find others um, with similar experiences and advice and expertise that they could share with each other. And from a family and patient group on Facebook, this rapidly grew over the next few years to the EBF3 HADS Foundation, and they are recognizing February now as a HADS Awareness Month. And so a community has now grown so much from just this very early beginnings in the biomedical research. But this community is important for many ways, not just for the families and patients, but it's incredibly important for our research efforts to better understand the condition and to hopefully find therapeutic avenues as well. 
And that's because we can't do it in isolation. Clinical medicine, biomedical research, and the families have to come together. We are partners in this entire journey, and we stay that way to be able to reach our ultimate goals. And an illustration of this is that shortly after we made this discovery in 2017, my team and I established a um, dedicated clinic for EBF3 HADS based at Texas Children's Hospital. And this clinic directly interfaces actually with our uh, research laboratory at the Jan and Dan Duncan Neurological Research Institute. So we're accomplishing many goals in this. We are educating our clinical colleagues to better recognize this condition. We're bringing attention to EBF3 and HADS syndrome in biomedical research. And we partner very closely with the patients and their families so that they give us insights into what are the critical questions that we need to answer and to look at and to address. And it was through this collaboration um, between everyone that we've actually now made great strides in better understanding EBF3 and human neurologic conditions from that initial few individuals who helped contribute and spark the research um, endeavors, it led us to understand that there is this constellation of a condition called HAD syndrome. But what we're now understanding is, one, it's newly discovered, it's rare now, um, and but there is great strength in those numbers and that recognition because now we're understanding that this may give us greater implications for also very common conditions like autism spectrum disorders and ep um, uh, sorry, anxieties and ADHD as well. So from moving from a few, we actually have great strength in numbers and understanding many, many implications as well. And hopefully by working towards HAD syndrome and helping with EBF3, we can actually benefit many others um, as a team effort. And so I wanted to kind of just recap a little bit just to see the timeline and the reality of how quickly we're now able to do this because of not just technology, but because of collaborations. You've heard stories that have spanned decades and there have been many gene discoveries that have taken 20, 30 years to really accomplish. And we're talking about something that is happening on the scale of months to years. From 2010, when initial technological advances happened to allow clinical exome sequencing being available, despite being considered experimental by insurance companies at the time, um, it really opened a, a, a big resource to how we can help with human disease. Two, for EBF3 in 2015 and 2016, the initial work beginning at the Undiagnosed Diseases Network at Baylor College of Medicine and Texas Children's with many others, where we found the EBF3 genetic change, we developed the research and model organism studies to basically within a year discovering conclusively that this is the gene underlying this condition called HAD syndrome and the onset of the next chapter now. Now that we know that this exists, we, what we need to do is understand better why, and then how can we do something to intervene if possible. And so within the next year after that, there was this rapid growth between collaborations of the community of medicine and science, the dedicated clinic, our research laboratory for EBF3 related HAD syndrome, and of course the ongoing clinical research study, which has really given us very crucial insights into this condition and this gene. And by 2019, the community came together and formed the EBF3 HADS Foundation. They hosted the first international HADS conference at Texas Children's. And for the first time, families that have felt very much by themselves and alone or um, just unique, realize they are still unique, but that there are many, many others sharing the same journey with them at the same time. And together, they've really embarked on this um, community outreach and awareness campaign that I think in 2020 is gonna take us and beyond sorry, it's 2020, 2021 and beyond, um, into like a greater new direction. Um, so more awareness, more outreach, but also more um, activities now to really help us on our research efforts as well. And so this is starting to come full circle. I'm not able to go into all the details of what we're doing in the laboratory for EBF3 for HAD syndrome and for many of the other rare diseases that my team has also participated in the diagnosis and discovery of as well. But we're hoping that these eventually will bring us to some type of a therapeutic avenue um, at some point in the ongoing future. And so I wanted just to emphasize, you know, the goal of NORD of these rare disease activities and, you know, rare disease advisory councils, they're so important. They're helping us build these bridges between basic research where we need the research scientists to be invested, to have this funding support to do this research, um, you know, to focus on that one or two or three individuals and help us solve these answers at the very beginning with these model organisms, with these genetic technologies. 
and then bridge that with the clinical clinicians and the clinical researchers um, so that we can conduct these studies that are so important for better understanding these conditions, um, gaining that expertise so that it's easier for others to recognize and diagnose and prognosticate, and then also make available and develop a repository of samples and resources so that we can encourage the research field to grow. And then ultimately, we need to move toward therapy. That is ultimately the goal for anyone that's involved. And sometimes that path is faster <laughs> than others, but we're always marching toward that direction. And it needs translational research, this bridge between everything, where we're combining the biomedical research with our humble model organisms or test tube studies, and really moving into how we can do this for preclinical efficacies. How can we collaborate with industries um, and ongoing so that we can really bridge this? And so I'm just going to end briefly. I mean, there's been a lot behind it, but there's been a great team that underlies all of that. So my lab at the, uh, Duncan NRI um, has been immensely instrumental in many, many of these discoveries. Our colleagues, both within the Undiagnosed Diseases Network, as well as nationally, internationally. And here I've highlighted the EBF3 Hads Foundation, who's been so instrumental in moving a lot of our research commitments forward. And as you've heard from um, Debbie earlier, there's been great interest in our work and what we um, hope to be able to accomplish both from foundation levels, uh, from our clinical societies, as well as from NIH. Um, so I'm very um, fortunate um, and we're very excited for the future to come. And I'm here now um, if we have any questions, if anyone's interested um, that I can discuss further. And I just want to say, if you do have questions for Dr. Chow, you can put them in the chat or you can, um, I was looking, does this have a raise your hand? Put them in the chat, I think. Okay. Great comments. <laughs> okay, it looks like uh, no, no questions at this time. So, okay. Thank you, Dr. Chow, so much. We really appreciate you, Thank you uh, joining us. And with that, we are going to give away some door prizes. I love giving away prizes. <laughs> the first thing we'll be giving away are two swag bags full of Nord goodies. So I will turn it over to Kristen from Nord, who will be picking those names of participants in today's event. Great. That's the swag bag, guys. <laughs> so we've got two of these nice swag bags to raffle off, and I'm going to share a fun little screen here. Um, I went by the names that your Zoom accounts say right now, so uh, we will need you to email um, us your contact information if your name is selected. And sorry, I'm trying to find my internet here. Oh. Apologies, folks, I'm having some technical issues. <sighs> okay, let's try this again. There we go. All right. This is going to be our lovely wheel of names. So we've got everybody's here. I'm going to click. And Leah McDonald. Yay. <laughs> Um, Leah, if you are there, Anissa, can you pop my email address into the chat and just email us your contact information? So congratulations. We're going to pull one more of the swag bag boxes. Adam Hansen. Okay, so next um, we have, we are very lucky to have a couple of local sponsors. We have Orchard Therapeutics, 
who has sponsored a $500 Visa gift card. And with that, please welcome Megan Perry from Orchard. Hi, everyone. <laughs> can you hear me okay, Deb? Yes, we can. And I believe oh, she has a video there. Yes. Thank you so much for having us and for Baylor and Nord and Deborah for allowing us to be here with you today. So Orchard Therapeutics is, is working on and committed to rare disease um, work. And so I have a little video on genetics and gene therapy that we thought you might find interesting today. So thank you. Oh, I'm going to get that video up right now. Okay, that's not gonna work. I am having some issues with the video today, unfortunately. So let me um, go back to our, our PowerPoint and see if I can play it from there. We had some technical glitches with that as well. Yeah, no worries. Our genes, about 25,000 of them, lie on our chromosomes and are made of DNA. We find them inside our body's cells. Picture each gene as a sentence in your body's instruction manual. All humans have mostly the same genes, but how come we look so different? From both our parents, we inherit a unique genetic combination. Each gene describes where and how specific proteins are built. Proteins take care of essential tasks in our body, such as digesting our food, functioning of the brain, and even attacking invading bacteria. But what if a gene doesn't produce a protein the way it should? This is what happens in genetic diseases. And that's where gene therapy comes in. With gene therapy, a specially designed vehicle is created, a vector. It can carry a working copy of the missing or faulty gene and inserts it into cells. When the cell receives this new gene, it has the right information on how to create the proteins that are needed, helping cells to function as they should. Great, thank you. And now we're going to pull, Debbie, which uh, are we pulling right now? Yes, pull, pull the. <laughs> so this is for the $500 Visa gift card. Good luck, folks. So much and next let me say but there is more so we also have Kendrion Biopharma and they've sponsored a $200 Amazon gift card so please welcome Robert McCune from Kendrion. Debbie thank you so much and good afternoon to everyone it really is an honor and a privilege to uh, be joining all of you here today for the 2021 Texas Rare Disease Day virtual event. Um, allow me first to just introduce myself, uh, Rob McCune, and I am on the uh, marketing team at Kedrion Biopharma. And chances are you probably have not heard of Kedrion, and that's okay. We're a small company, but we are growing. And we're a company that you'll wanna keep an eye out um, as we grow over the years to come. All of our products right now are for rare diseases. So we definitely wanna build those connections uh, within the community here. 
I'm going to take just a couple minutes and, and give you some information on, on Kedrion and where to go to learn more about our products and our future. And uh, first, this is a beautiful picture of our manufacturing facility in uh, Bolognana, Italy. So our uh, global headquarters are in Italy. And actually, the name Kedrion is derived from the uh, Greek word kedros, which is a type of cedar tree that's known for its deep roots and therapeutic properties. And we really like that analogy because uh, Kedrion Biopharma, we've actually existed for decades and decades over in Europe and Italy. So we have those deep roots. And um, we are, uh, this year, actually, interestingly enough, we are celebrating our 10-year anniversary here in the U.S. So we have those deep roots and, and we have these products that are for rare diseases. So we do really like to uh, tell our story. The next slide will show you our global footprint. And right now we have over 2,700 employees worldwide. Um, Debbie, if we could go to the next slide. Uh, one back. There we go. Thank you. So, yeah, so we have 2,700 employees worldwide, 900 of which are in the U.S. Uh, we do have a commercial presence in over 100 countries, and we have 34 plasma collection centers uh, worldwide. And the reason that that is important is all of our products are plasma-derived therapies. So we have these plasma collection centers across the world. We collect the, the, the plasma, we fractionate and purify that plasma, and then we use that as a basis of manufacturing to come up with the products to treat uh, various rare diseases. And I mentioned before that we're a small player, but we're also the fifth uh, uh, largest player in the world in this uh, plasma-derived product space. So not too bad. So we're, uh, we're, we're definitely in, in good company, and, 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 and we absolutely have a very bright future ahead. And the next slide shows our plans for expansion into the future. So our plasma side of the business is referred to as KED plasma. And KED plasma right now, we have 27 uh, plasma collection centers uh, here in the US. And, and Kristen, if we could go to the next slide, please. Or Debbie. Yep, so we have 27 uh, plasma collection centers in the U.S., and you can see the call out. That's actually is from October 2020. Since then, we've actually picked up two more. So we actually have 29 plasma collection centers now across the U.S., and our, our goal by 2022 is to expand to 40 plasma collection centers. And having more plasma gives us the ability to uh, manufacture and produce more and more products. So that's why the, the plasma side of our business is just so, so important. So um, just wanted to give everyone here today just a little bit of background information about Kedrion Biopharma and who we are. Just so you know, we do have an IGIV 10% product that is indicated for primary immune deficiency as well as CIDP, uh, two rare diseases. We have a factor eight product for hemophilia, we have an anti-D product for RH sensitization. And then just a couple of years ago, we launched a human rabies immune globulin. So you can see that we're very active in this rare, di rare disease space. And if you'd like to learn more about Kedrion Biopharma, uh, Kristen and Debbie, if we could go to the final slide, um, I would encourage everyone to visit our website at www.kedrion.com. And here you can learn more about our company, our deep roots, uh, our products that are commercially available today, as well as our pipeline. You also see that we've been quite active on the COVID-19 front as well. So I would encourage all of you to visit this website to learn more about our company. And with that said, I'm gonna hand it back to, to Kristen. And I just wanna take the opportunity again on behalf of Kedrion Biopharma uh, to thank all of you for this opportunity to join you for this very special event. And I'll leave you with um, a, a quote that we heard at the beginning of this session. Alone, we are rare. Together, 
we are strong. Thank you. And Kristen, I'll hand it back over to you. Thank you. Sorry, folks. I have very slow internet this afternoon, so everything is taking some time to catch up. Um, <laughs> thank you, Robert, for sharing with us, and, and, and thank you again to um, both Orchard and, and to Kedrion for your donations of these great prizes that, that we're getting today. So we've got our final giveaway for the day, and then I'm going to uh, go right into a, a, sh a brief short um, thank you video we have, and then I'll turn it back over to Debbie for closing remarks. So good luck, everybody. Sarah Kay. Congratulations, you just won a $200 gift card. And I am now going to go into our video. Every year on the last day of February, the National Organization for Rare Disorders joins together with others around the world to raise awareness of the challenges faced by people living with rare diseases. Achieving health equity is even more difficult for rare patients. To have equity in health means everyone has an opportunity to be as healthy as possible, regardless of social, geographic, economic, or other obstacles that may be working against them. At Nord, we appreciate your support, which allows us to work on issues like health equity and many others and for our staff and volunteers to bring them to the forefront on Rare Disease Day. From the Volunteer State Ambassadors, we would like to say thank you to all of our Rare Action Network supporters for helping us connect with rare patients and families in our state. And thank you for allowing the Rare Action Network to raise important issues with state lawmakers on Rare Disease Day and throughout the year. Did you know that in medical school, I was told, when you hear hoofbeats, they think horses, not zebras. Well, what about the more than 25 million Americans living with a rare disease? At NORD, we are humbled to provide help and resources to our zebras and their caregivers. NORD support allowed me to catch up on some overdue bills, including my rent. Thank you for your support, NORD, and thank you for supporting Rare Disease Day. From all of us at NORD, thank you for your dedication to the rare disease community. On Rare Disease Day, and every day. Okay, thank, thank you guys so much for attending. Um, I want to thank you again for joining this year's event. It's been a pleasure co-hosting with Baylor College of Medicine and Texas Children's Hospital. We hope that you'll be able to um, meet you in person next year and do a live event. And I think we have a slide um, as before we conclude, I'd like to share some links to some websites that contain resources for the rare disease community. If you, um, if you haven't already joined the Texas Rare Action Network or RAN as we call it, please do so. You can join at the, um, raretext.org or at the through the links on the NORD websites as shown on the slide. On the Texas Reaction website, we have resources for you, such as the state report card and local and state events, emergency resources, COVID-19 resource and information, Baylor College of Baylor Undiagnosed Network, um, resources. We also have a Texas Reaction Facebook page and Instagram. The benefits of membership include daily and monthly updates on policy and events throughout the state that affect the rare disease community. And also we will alert you to advocacy opportunities. The mission of the Texas Reaction Network is to raise awareness, to educate and advocate for the rare disease community. Lastly, as I promised, this slide also contains a link to the Nord Hurricane and Natural Disaster Emergency Relief Program. And if you suffered damage from last week's Arctic freeze and subsequent power outages, I, apply, I encourage you to apply. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Susan Fernbach from Baylor College of Medicine and Texas Children's Hospital to conclude.
One more slide. <laughs> Susan, we're not hearing you. I'm sorry, I got kicked out of a meeting and I'm just back again. And uh, so I'm Susan Fernbach and I'm the co-director for the Office of Community Engagement and Diversity at Baylor College of Medicine and Texas Children's Hospital. And um, I really want to thank Deborah, I want to thank Molly Plant, Nord, uh, and my uh, co-leader, uh, Salma Nassef with Baylor for um, all of the activities today in the organization. Um, we really would love for anyone who's interested to join us in our community outreach, our Evenings with Genetics webinar series, and you can just go to the website there. We have an upcoming webinar on race and genetics on March 9th and on March 23rd. Uh, CRISPR and ethical considerations of children with intellectual and developmental disabilities and autism. And so please information you might be interested in. And I am a proud member of, of this committee and uh, uh, wearing my, uh, my zebra stripes uh, um, scarf. I will tell you it kept me warm last week during the weather in Houston. So thank you all very much for joining us today. And I believe this is it. Is this right, Deborah? Or is there one more um, item? To nope. I I want to just uh, thank you, thank um, Baylor School of Medicine and Texas Children's for you know continuing the wonderful relationship and working with us every year on Rare Disease Day and throughout the year. Um, and thank you to all of our speakers today for sharing. Um, and a special thank you to Debbie Skolaski and Molly Plant for planning such a great event today on Rare Disease Day. Um, I encourage you all to tune in on social media. We're trending right now with the hashtag Rare Disease Day. So there's a lot of fun posts and stories being shared all across the internet today. So uh, continue showing your stripes online and thank you all for joining us today. And congratulations to our wonderful winners. Uh, keep an eye out uh, in a few weeks, you'll be receiving your prize. Have a great day, everybody.